With the anticipated release of Hellblade 2, I found time to jump into the first game about a week ago and really liked it. I tried to play it about two years ago but never got round to committing to completing it, but I'm gutted I didn't. I've always been pretty interested in Norse mythology and folklore, and the story from the first game was pretty solid. But then, the second game released. Now, the second game was met with, let's just say, mixed reviews. Lots of players loved it, but some outlets and YouTubers reviewed the game and didn't like it at all, and that's fair enough. While a lot of criticisms were valid, having obviously played both games myself, I think that maybe these reviewers went in with lofty expectations of what this game would actually be, instead expecting an action-adventure epic. Other complaints were about the 5-hour runtime, this game took me roughly 8-9 to nine hours, because as a lore guy I try to find everything the game has to offer. If you don't do that in these games, then the story and its connected lore can easily be lost on you if you aren't making the effort to discover the lore and are just running from point A to point B. I don't really have an opinion on the game itself in terms of a full review. I went into the game fully knowing what to expect, a linear, story-driven experience absolutely soaked in Norse mythology and Icelandic folklore. Therefore, my views on the game weren't really affected by false expectations. The first game was a slow burn and was definitely an acquired taste. That being said, I'm here to talk about the story from here on out. Please be aware before we begin that there will be spoilers in this video for both Hellblade titles, so you have been warned. Let's jump in. It's the 8th century and Senwa, a Celtic Pict warrior from the Orkney Islands in Scotland, has arrived at the border to Helheim, the Nordic afterlife, in an attempt to save the soul of her love Dillian. But here's a bit of background while Senwa is busy rowing. Senwa was born to her father Zinbel and her mother Galena. Galena suffered from a mild form of psychosis where she would hear voices and see faces in her surroundings. This condition passed on to Senua, who considered it a curse, although Galena tried to make Senua see that the voices were not a curse at all, that she simply sees the world differently to others. Senua's father Zinbel, however, was a druid, and he believed that Galena's condition was a curse. A fanatic and trying to appease the gods, Zimbal and the rest of the villagers tied Galena to a stake and burned her alive. Now, this traumatized five-year-old Senua, instead making up a story in her head that her mother had ended herself to get rid of her darkness. Knowing that Senua had the same condition, Zimbel abused Senua physically and mentally and shut her away from the outside world. On the rare occasions that Zimbel would allow his daughter out, she would watch a young man, a warrior called Dillian, training with a sword and she would watch and learn skills for herself. Eventually, they would become good friends and this later turned into romance, with Dillian helping Senua understand and accept her condition. Senua then participated in the warrior trials, as did Dillian, and they both passed. Telling her father that she would be leaving the village ended in an argument, where Zimbel told Senua that it's the darkness speaking through her. He told her that her curse will doom everyone, that she'll have blood on her hands, and that the gods can only fix her through his hand. Nonetheless, Senua and Dillian left. They eventually settled in Dillian's village, where she became a warrior, but years later, a plague would break out in the village, killing many villagers. But more on Senua's past in a few minutes. Arriving at the shore, hearing voices, or furies, as Senua calls them, she moves through the area whilst being followed by the darkness, the entity at the centre of her curse, as she puts it, and this darkness, or the shadow, attempts to discourage her, telling her that she'll always be cursed. Further up, she spots the gate to Helheim. However, the bridge is inaccessible, so she has to find another way. She's carrying with her the head of Dillian, as it's a vessel for his soul. Approaching a door with a strange sigil on it, Senua remembers teachings from a man she once knew called Druth. Here's more background. So when the plague hit the village, Senua thought that the plague was a result of her condition, her curse. So she left and journeyed into the wild in an attempt to protect Dillian and to try and rid herself of the darkness. This is where she encountered Druth. Druth was an Irish scholar who was captured by a group called the Northmen, who were conquering territories and Druth was enslaved. He managed to escape the Northmen during one of their raids and ran into the wild and that is how he met Senua. Anyway, Druth would tell Senua all about the legends of the Northmen such as Helheim and he promised Senua that he would help guide her in both this life and the next. Druth died not long afterwards. Senua obviously then returned to the village and found Dillian dead, not from the plague though. He'd been sacrificed to the Norse gods by the Northmen who had raided the village. The villagers blamed Senua that her curse had brought darkness and death upon the village. Senua then cut off Dillian's head and took it with her, determined to save his soul, and this leads us to the point that the game takes place. Anyway, Druth explains that the runes on the door are what are sealing the gates to hell, so Senua needs to focus and find that which is hidden in plain sight. 
Looking around the room, Senua finds the room she's looking for. This opens up the door, and after traversing various beams and ledges, Senua arrives in a room with a large door adorned with a tree, along with two other doors bearing a red and yellow symbol. The large door is the door to the road to Helheim, but it's locked. Senua turns around and senses a darkness there with her. It's Hela, the goddess of the dead. Senua realizes this and offers to give her what she wants and tries to touch Hela. Senua recoils as a dark rot spreads up her arm. The voices in her head, her furies are going frantic, causing massive confusion and are telling her to get up. She is confronted and has to battle against manifestations of her own fears, these being represented as the ferocious Northmen that attacked her village and killed Dillion. Her furies aid her in combat by warning her of danger, but eventually she is defeated. But, but actually she's not, this was just a vision. If she falls too many times to the things that haunt her, then the rot will travel up to her head, which is the seat of the soul, and it will completely consume her. She remembers what Druth told her, that in order to open the large door, Senua needs to slay the two gods that guard it, the god of illusion, Valravan, and the fire giant, Surt. Heading through the door of Valravan, Senua instantly sees the power of Valravan. She has to manipulate the environment using portals, and Valravan is watching her. He's observing, or is he? Fighting off more manifestations of the Northmen, Senua carries on manipulating the environment and matching up symbols to open up more doors. Eventually, she manages to confront Valravan. Valravan is actually a figure from Danish folklore. He is the master of ravens and an ancestor of the seers. The story goes that if a king or chieftain fell in battle, ravens would come and eat his body. These ravens would then become Valravan. After an arduous battle, Senua defeats him and takes his seal, one of two down. Going back to the room, Senua now goes through the other door, the door to the fire giant, Surt. Walking through the domain of Surt, the fire giant, Senua travels through a foreshadowing of Surt's level of destruction. It shows Senua various settlements that have been raided and their bodies have been burned, sacrifices to Surt himself. Senua remembers that Druth had previously told her about the Northmen's sacrifices to Surt, as he'd witnessed these sacrifices during his time in captivity. But a bit of background on Surt. As already mentioned, Surt is a fire giant. His name translates as the Black One on account of him appearing burnt. He comes from another of the Nine Worlds called Muspelheim, where he sits at the border. He is a beast that uses a flaming sword, and he obviously holds the second mark that Senua needs in order to progress along the bridge to Helheim. He looks like one of the Northmen, but he's much larger and more ferocious. Surt is thought to be an important part of the great Norse battle Ragnarok, the destiny of the gods, during which he will travel via ship to Asgard and Midgard, and alongside the fire giants he will battle the Asa, the principal group of Norse deities such as Odin, Vili and Loki, and he will also battle the god Freyr, and the flames that he will bring forth will cover the earth. But back to it. Fighting off yet more manifestations of the Northmen, Senua reaches the location of Surt. Approaching him, he's an imposing beast, but again after a challenging fight, Surt is defeated and Senua takes with her the second mark. Returning to the main door with the two marks that she got, Senua opens the door to the bridge to Helheim, despite her furies pleading with her not to. After being subjected to another vision of finding Dillian dead and sacrificed, Senua is discouraged by the shadow. Nonetheless, Senua pushes on and across the bridge, fighting more manifestations of the Northmen. Solving more problems on the other side of the bridge and opening up more doorways, Senua walks toward the final doorway to Helheim. She is confronted by Hela, the giantess. She's very menacing, the source of the darkness. The shadow tells Senua that she's a disgrace. Gathering her strength and courage, Senua aims a swing at Hela, but this is futile. Since Hela is a god, the sword Senua is using is now shattered, and she is swatted away and off of the bridge. But here's a bit about Hela. As previously mentioned, Hela is the goddess of the dead. She's also the daughter of Loki. She is half blue and half flesh coloured according to the prose Edda book titled Gilfaginning. Hela's bloodline was feared by the gods. Her mother's bloodline was bad, but her father's even worse. Now, when she was younger, Hela, as a result of the fear of her bloodline, was cast down into Helheim by the Allfather, Odin, and as its ruler, she was given power over the people who died of sickness, age, hardship, and self-slaughter. We'll go into it a bit further into this video, but these outcasts would often rise again as undead monsters called Droiga. Only Hela can resurrect the dead. It was to Hela that Dylan was sacrificed. But back into the story again. Coming to, injured, dazed, and confused, 
Senua sees a human figure shrouded in bright light, seemingly leading her somewhere. Assuming it to be Dillian, she follows it. Senua pushes on, pushing up the shoreline in an attempt to find another way to Helheim. Whilst following the glowing figure, wreck Viking longships litter the beach. She discovers another door and this one cannot be opened. Another path is needed. Continuing up the beach, Senua sees the figure now standing in front of a very large tree. She is transported into a vision of her earlier years and the time that she met Dillian. Happier times. But she is thrown back onto the beach again shortly after and is in front of the tree which is now burning. The shadow tries to taunt her but she screams at the voice to shut up and it does. Inside the tree is a sword called Gram. Here's some folklore regarding the sword. The Northmen tell of a great hero. His name is Sigmund. His father's hall was built around a great tree, and one day, Odin comes and thrusts a sword into the tree, a gift to whomever can release it. Many try, but the sword only comes out at Sigmund's touch. His brother-in-law, King Sigir, wants it, but Sigmund refuses him, so King Sigir plots revenge. He invites Sigmund and his brothers to a feast, but when they arrive, they are met with an army, not a warm welcome. King Sigir captures Sigmund and his brothers, steals his coveted sword, and readies them for execution. Death for Sigmund and his brothers seems certain. But the king's wife is Sigmund's sister, and she begs for mercy, and implores the king to chain them up instead. He agrees. Not for mercy though, but because he plans an even more cruel and lingering death. Chained to a tree in the forest that night, a she-wolf comes and devours one of Sigmund's brothers. She returns, ravenous, night after night, until only Sigmund is left. The next day, Sigmund's sister sends a servant with honey to smear on Sigmund's face. But to what end? Well, that night, when the she-wolf appears again, You'll never guess what happens as the she-wolf licks the sweet honey from Sigmund's face. He bites the wolf's tongue. The she-wolf pulls away, but Sigmund holds on. The chains break, and he is free. After his escape, Sigmund lives like us, hidden in the forest. His enemy, King Sigir, believing him dead, as his sister plots revenge. And for vengeance to succeed, even the great Sigmund needs help. So she sends her sons to him. But their blood is weak and corrupted, and they're put to death by Sigmund. So his sister hatches a new plan, one that is cold of heart and pure of blood. Sigmund's sister trades shapes with a sorceress, and in disguise, she lies with her own brother. She gives birth to a son named Sinfjotli. After a time, she sends him to the forest to Sigmund. He tests the boy and finds him strong and fearless. And so they go to take their vengeance on King Sigir. But luck is not on their side. They're captured and Sigir has them buried alive. As Sigmund and Sinfjotli are being buried alive, Sigmund's sister throws an armful of straw into the grave mound. Hidden in the straw is Sigmund's sword, the gift of Odin. They cut their way out of the grave mound and set fire to Sigir's hall. The king burns to death. Sigmund calls to his sister to come out so that she may live and be honored. She does come out, but only to tell him the truth. That she had slept with him, her brother, to beget a strong avenger. I am not fit to live, she says, and walks back into the fire. And here is the end of Sigmund's story. He was a fierce and great warrior who fought many battles. One day, an old man came onto the battlefield. Although shadowed by a hood, Sigmund saw that he only had one eye. The man raised his spear, and Sigmund struck at it with his sword, but the sword shattered into pieces. Sigmund then knew that this was Odin, and thus that victory could not be his. He bowed his head and accepted his end. Dying, he tells his wife that she is with child, 
and that her son will one day make a great weapon out of the fragments of his sword. The sword named Gram. One other interesting piece of folklore is that the sword Gram was used to kill a dragon. Anyway, Senua tries to take the sword but is unable to, however she seems to have activated several stones in the area. She recalls that Druth told her about this sword, that it's capable of killing a god. It's being stuck in the tree as an illusion, and that in order to repair the sword, Senua must complete four trials. The trials in question are the four trials of Odin. Each trial allows Senua to retrieve a shard of the sword. Entering into the trial, Senua discovers that these trials are relevant to things that she has suffered in some point in her life. She has to mount the courage to overcome them in order to get what she needs, in order to proceed and to help Dillian's soul. Interacting with a stone will transport Senua to a different land. One trial is a labyrinth. Inside the labyrinth, as expected, it's a maze, except it changes. With a torch in hand, she navigates the labyrinth, hearing the screams of someone who got trapped in there. She assumes it to be Dylan, and later she sees the glowing figure. Finding her way through the labyrinth, Senua realizes that although the figure is Dillian, the voice is not Dillian's as it grows more and more distorted. She eventually comes to a glowing red gate, and realizing that Dillian wants her to face her fears, Senua walks through it. After a short vision and memory of her telling her father that she's leaving the village to go away with Dillian, she is back by the tree again. The second trial is called the Tower Trial. Senua sees the glowing figure again, but losing sight of it results in her furies frantically asking Senua where he is. In the trial, Senua uses masks and illusions to travel to different times, and traverses the tower, and once at the top she sees Dillian. Running towards Dillian and calling out, she crosses a narrow beam. She sees him jump off of the edge, and she has a memory of a previous conversation with Dillian. Back on the shore again, she heads for the third trial. This third trial is called the Swamp Trial, located in an area ravaged by plague, where many died. In this trial, Senua moves through a diseased swamp village, deceased bodies lie everywhere, and she has to escape her maze whilst avoiding a fiery entity that's chasing her. Finding the three symbols that she needs in order to escape, Senua evades the monster and leaves the maze. She sees another memory of her being blamed for the plague that hit the village due to her curse. And for the fourth and final trial named the Blindness Trial, it's based upon the notion that in blindness one can find wisdom. This goes back to something that Odin did. He wanted to drink from Mimir's well, the Well of Wisdom, underneath the world tree Yggdrasil. He exchanged his eye for this wisdom. The reason this is relevant is that Senua must walk through a pitch black area, using only her senses whilst avoiding bumping into monsters that are prowling around in the darkness, with her being careful not to make a sound. Thankfully, she hears the calming, reassuring voice of Dillian guiding her. Reaching the end of the trial, Senua finds a well and jumps into it, but she doesn't hear Dillian's voice anymore. Panicking slightly and avoiding more monsters, she walks into the light and sees a memory of her leaving the village and her self-imposed exile into the wilds. Now back on the shore with the four trials completed and with Odin's blessing, Senua is able to take Gram and is now able to walk as a goddess into the halls of Helheim and challenge Hela as an equal to herself. Of course, the shadow is in her head, telling her that she should leave the sword as it's tainted by the gods of darkness, and the shadow tells her that she will pay a price for taking it. She has yet another memory of when she and Dillian found Dillian's father dead from the plague and the subsequent blame. Senua is then transported by the shadow to another horrible place called the Sea of Corpses, and this is the shadow's way of reminding Senua that she is responsible for the deaths of those around her. She passes through the hands of the dead which are trying to grab her, and she fights off more manifestations of the Northmen. After passing through the Sea of Corpses and seeing the tormented face of her mother there, Senua is able to leave and returns to the shore once more. She has what she needs. Heading back to the door, Senua is now able to open it as she is a goddess. With Gram in hand, Senua enters the mountain and makes her way up, but she is being stalked by a new threat. This threat is in the form of Garm, Hela's hound. This hound guards Helheim for its master. The creature can only hunt Senua in the dark, so as long as she's in the light, she is safe. But Senua sees a vision of her mother, and the shadow casts doubt on the vision, saying that it's not her. Her mother is begging her to help her get out. Senua needs to find more symbols in order to open up the door and proceed. Whilst avoiding Garm by staying in the light, and fighting more Northmen manifestations, Senua finds all three symbols. She's confused about the vision of her mother, wondering why her mother appears to be trapped there. Proceeding through the now unlocked door, the vision of her mother was a trap, and Garm gives chase. Senua runs and makes it to a bridge, but the bridge fails. Dillian's head falls from her side and down into the depths below. 
into Garm's lair. The shadow rubs it in and says that Dillian's fate is now sealed. The shadow also reminds her of the torment at the hands of her father. Determined to find Dillian's head, Senua heads down into the beast's lair. More Northmen manifestations attack her, but this is nothing compared to the battle she is about to be in. She is confronted by Garm and she must fight the beast in order to escape with Dillian's head. The beast is ferocious, but after a tense fight, Senua manages to defeat Garm. After the fight, the shadow tells Senua that it's been trying to discourage her from reaching Hela and from reaching a truth that would have destroyed her a long time ago. The shadow says that this was for her safety. Senua believes that after everything that she's fought for, she can't turn back now and the shadow says that it won't stand in her way. However, it does tell her that she won't survive what is ahead. Feeling Hela's gaze upon her, Senua has to repair the bridges to Helheim that Hela damaged earlier on. With the bridge repaired, Senua moves across it fighting off more Northmen. Finally, she is able to confront Hela. She enters a long hall and a portal takes her to Hela's sanctum. Her furies do not want her to go as they're scared that they'll die with Senua. Senua heads towards the portal anyway. Before she steps through, she receives a message from Druth. The man I was before Druth. Arriving in Hela's sanctum, Senua is treated to a lovely memory of her mother being burned at the stake by their village. This makes Senua remember how her mother really died, as a result of her father's zeal and due to his fear of the gods. She is approached by the shadow, he's dressed all in black, just like how her father used to dress. The shadow has actually been her own mind's manifestation of her father, still torturing her mentally after all those years. Therefore, Druth has implied that this man in black, Senua's father Zinbel, was responsible for the Northmen attack on Senua and Dillon's village, and by extension, Dillion's murder. Hela now appears. Senua realizes that Hela is purely a manifestation of the darkness inside her, and she charges towards Hela. Hela retreats and sends Northmen to attack Senua, but she takes them all down. Hela gets more desperate and tries to throw manifestations of Valravan's certain garm at her, again, to no avail. As a last stand, Hela summons an infinite amount of Northmen, and overwhelmed, Senua is defeated by them. Hela approaches Senua, who is badly wounded, taking the sword from her. Senua comes to the understanding that since this is all a manifestation of her own mind, Hela is not real, therefore saving Dillian's soul is not something that can be done at all. She still tries to offer herself up as a sacrifice for Dillian's soul, but after Hela says nothing, Senua tells Hela to just kill her, as she simply has nothing left now. Hela then kills Senua. Hela takes Dillian's head and standing on the edge, she drops the head down into the dark abyss below. However, in a turn of events, Senua and Hela have now switched places, indicating that Senua is now at peace with herself, her psychosis and the fact that Dillian is gone. She says goodbye, saying there's another story to tell, and she leaves. The game then ends. So one point of contention in this game is, was what Senua experienced even real? Well, yes and no, I guess. In terms of Senua, she battles a lot of voices inside her own head, whether that be her fury second guessing her every decision, belittling her or even at times giving her advice, or the voice of her father. Senua certainly did go on a journey to Helheim. However, there were enemies that were not real. Senua is on a journey of self-acceptance just as much as she's on a journey to save the soul of Dillian. I don't normally vibe with the whole it was in the head of the protagonist, but it worked here. 
These things Senua experienced in the game and her journey to Helheim were all manifestations due to the teachings that Druth had told her during their time in the wilds. However, I do believe that she physically went to Helheim. The gods she had to defeat were manifestations of what was in her mind, such as Valraven and Surt, her guilt and shame at her condition. That because of her believing it's a curse, death follows her wherever she goes. The darkness or the shadow inside her is essentially her father, the remnants of how he would abuse her mentally and physically, and this is seen through her fight with the Hound Garm. The voice of her father actively tried to discourage her in order to make her fearful and weak, and so that she wouldn't find the truth. And this of course culminated in the battle against Hela. This battle and defeating Hela, who appeared as a version of Senua herself at the end, allowed Senua to gather the strength that she needed in order to move on. That in fact Dillian was killed by the Northmen as a sacrifice to the gods, and not because of her. She accepted that Dillian was gone and was not coming back. She accepted that the Furies inside her head were there, and instead of hating them, she could just accept that they are a part of her. In my research for this game, I came across a Reddit comment from a user whose account has unfortunately been deleted, but it explains the Hela Senua thing at the end really, really well. The commenter states that there are two main aspects of Senua's mind, one influenced by the words of her mother, and one influenced by the words of her father. Her mother told her that she simply sees the world differently to other people, that her condition is not a curse. Her mother's face would show up at various points in the story with these words of affirmation. This Senua was influenced by her mother, and then later by Dillian, who helped her to try and accept her condition. Her father, on the other hand, was a constant. He abused her to the point that the trauma that she carried with her meant that he was always inside her head. The Senua we are playing as is the warrior, the part that won't give up, that will keep fighting hopeless battles in order to save Dillian. And this is the part of her that basically forgot how her mother really died due to the trauma and the abuse at the hands of her father. This Senua can't really accept her condition, and she can't accept that Dillian is gone, and this in large part is due to the influence that her father has over her. And then there's the other Senua. Strangely, it seems that the bad character in this story is actually the one that needs to win out in order for the person to truly move on. This part of Senua's mind is portrayed and manifested by Senua as Hela. We see this through the darkness or the rot. The Senua that is really doing the damage to Senua is the Senua we play as. But that wraps up the first game, now let's move on to the second. After the events of her journey to Helheim, Senua found and settled in another village. However, her village was raided by Northmen, and they were taking slaves. Senua would allow herself to be taken by the Northmen onto their ships, and across the seas back to their lands in the hope that she can trace them back to their poisonous source and eradicate it. In the midst of a vicious storm, Senua, the other slaves and the slavers, are thrown from the ships and into the raging seas. As Senua fights underwater with a slaver, whilst her furies are willing her to survive, Senua washes up on the shore. She is shocked to see a lot of her people dead on the shore. Moving up, Senua sees a mysterious figure standing in the distance watching her. She climbs the rocks, her furies telling her to be careful. At the top, she is confronted by the shadow, who tells her that she should not have gone there. The place she has ended up is called Rekianesta, a small peninsula in Iceland. The land has not long been claimed by the Northmen, and the fact is that they are still trying to tame the land. Hearing the voice of Druth again, she finds out that she's in Midgard, the world of men, and as mentioned earlier, one of the Nine Realms. She is far from home, but she still needs to go to the heart of this place. Being taunted by the shadow, she finds the bloody remains of her people as she moves further inland, and she eventually sees one of the slavers in the distance. Following him, Senua sees a female slave try to attack the slaver with a sword, but the two fall to their deaths. Senua is blocked from progressing by a strange growth. She manages to find a symbol and aligns it, and this opens the way again. She sees the echoes of the dead, crying out for help. She is attacked by a slaver, but she manages to use the slaver's sword against him. She now has a weapon. After fighting more slavers and almost dying after getting trapped underneath the capsized boat, Senua is confronted by the man who appears to be the head slaver. The two fight. He's tough and seems to be toying with Senua, but she incapacitates him by wounding his knee. She tells the man that he's going to take her to where he came from. After a few hours walk, the slaver says that the sigil he wears around his neck is the sigil of his father who is the Godi, or the chieftain of Burgavirki. The Godi is also known as the speaker for the gods. In the distance, they spot a settlement. It's a settlement called Freyslaug. Freyslaug and the people who live there are under the Godi's rule, and by extension, his protection. Whilst walking towards the settlement, the slaver tells Senua that she won't survive this place. 
They look upon Freyslug and the slaver says that they must go no further. He seems to be scared, and he says that the settlement has fallen to something he calls the Droiger. Senua hears the cries of the dying, the cries of people in agony. Wanting to help them, Senua heads towards Freyslaug, walking past the grave mounds. The grave mounds appear to have been disturbed, and the slaver repeatedly tells Senua that she has no idea what she's walking into. He refuses to enter the settlement, so Senua ties him up and leaves him there at the entrance. Senua enters. It's not pretty. There are bodies everywhere. The entire settlement has been massacred. Once again, Senua's path across a bridge is blocked, and she has to line up shapes and symbols in order to make her way through. After she does this, she approaches the bridge, and once again she is confronted by the Shadow, who transports her to the home from her childhood. Inside the home, she finds her mirror, the mirror that helps her to focus. The Shadow then reminds her of one of the Northmen attacks on her village. Using her mirror to focus, she defeats the manifestations of the Northmen attackers, and one by one, she dispatches them. After, Senua finds herself in a tranquil and quiet place but she eventually gets reminded of Dillian's death. The Shadow says that Senua will never be able to leave her past behind. After more taunting, Senua says that she's going to keep moving forward and moves across the bridge. She sees a distant glow on the horizon and begins to move towards it. She hears groaning, screaming and chanting. She sees what the slaver was so afraid of, the Droiger. However dark it seemed, I always found a ray of light. In this wretched land, by far the darkest of them all, it seemed the shadow would never lift. But I knew I would find my light. Who is he? He knows her. He feels us. Reaching out to us in the dark. You have to help him, Senua. This is our quest. This is our destiny. Senua, would you give your life for these outsiders? In my darkest hour, it was an outsider who saved me. Carefully moving through the area, trying not to disturb the Droiger, Senua witnesses the pure barbarism of the undead. They are gathering sacrifices for a ritual, but a ritual for what, exactly? Senua approaches Fargrima, and a fight ensues, as the Droiger aren't exactly happy with Senua gatecrashing their ritual. But now let's take a short break and dive into some more folklore. In the Norse world, death was not seen as the end. Warriors who died in battle, some were chosen by the Valkyrie and would go to Valhalla, but this luxury was not reserved for every warrior that fell. Half of the chosen warriors would then go to Freya in order to live at Folkvanger and would feast in the Great Hall there. The less fortunate warriors would end up walking the road to Hell and would be ruled by the goddess Hell. Some of these dead would come back, in this case as undead warriors known as the Droiger. The Droiger would copy the customs of the living and would conduct rituals, something known as the Blot, which is an exchange. Sacrifice to the gods in order to get something in return, such as the goodwill of the gods themselves. But back into the story. Senua fights off many of the Droiger, and eventually she is able to get to Fargrimmer. He tells her that they need to get out of there, and the ground begins to shake. Freeing him, Fargrimmer screams the name Ilatoiga, and tells Senua to run, and they just about make it to safety. The entire area is completely destroyed in the aftermath. Walking back towards Freyslag, Fargrimmer tells Senua that he's from a place nearby that is known as Red Hills. He says that he went to seek help from the people of Freyslaug and was caught up in the Droiger onslaught and they took him to be sacrificed to this Ilatoiga, a creature that the Droiger seemed to worship. He also mentions that the slaver is called Thorgestra. Reaching Thorgestra, it seems that he and Fargrimmer know one another, or rather Fargrimmer knows the Godi, his father. Fargrimmer offers to treat his knee back at his settlement. Thorgestra agrees to go with them. Fargrimmer then tells Senua that Ilatoiga is a giant and she awakens at sundown and hunts in the night. Problem is that the nights are getting longer and it's approaching winter. They then leave for Red Hills. Nearing sunset, Fargrimmer mentions that he'd led his people to Red Hills for a new life, but it didn't go well as Ilatoiga is constantly stalking his settlement. Then an interesting conversation takes place between Fargrimmer and Thorgestra. Gods, what a ruin. Where is everyone? On the rocks, hi. Safe. 
But if I can't reach them, you should have joined us when we offered you the chance. There is no honor in the path you've chosen. Say that again, old man. And I'll cut you like a fish. Thorgester, have a look around you. Have a thought as to who your real enemy is. What does he mean? Who is the real enemy? The giants are the real enemy. No honor. He said there was no honor in the enslaver's path. Moving down the hill, Senua can sense something, as can Fagrima. She's coming. Running from Ilatoiga, who has been stalking them, Senua makes it to a clearing. Get out! After escaping, another very interesting conversation takes place. Make him explain. What is happening, Iltoiga? Who is she? So when the volcano erupted, it tore open the wall between this world and your time. Now suffers too. The giants came flooding from the east, killing and eating More whomever they could lay their hands on. And now some of us, we hide. You have to fight, not hide. Make defenses, struggle on. And some of us use others to stem the tides. Others? What do you mean? Shall I tell her, Thorgestur? Tell me, tell me. Shall I tell her what your father's been doing? What else is there to do, Fagrimer? We found a way to keep our people safe. He was part of it too, he believes. Your people are dying. Yes, there is no other way. Tell us, tell us. What are they doing? The Gode of Borkarvirki is using slaves. Slaves from your lands. Sacrifices. Sacrifice. He's offering them to the giants so that his people will be left. He hates innocent people. Evil. This stops now. He's a monster. You can't stand alone against us. You have no giants. He does not see, but he can see. His darkness is evil. We can show him. He's a monster. There is another way. There is always another way. Toga has your mark now. If you try to leave the Red Hills, he will hunt and kill you. No. And I will kill her first. She, she can't be killed. It's impossible. I have killed a god, Fagrima. Now at Red Hills, Senua is once again tormented by the Shadow. The Shadow this time round is trying to make her doubt her ability to be able to kill the giant. After a journey through a dark forest-like labyrinth, Senua fights some more Northmen, and is confronted once again of the memory of her mother's death at the hands of her father. Except this time it's Senua who is being burned. The Shadow says that they must cleanse their sins with sacrifice, with blood, and because that's the way of the gods. This is truly her father speaking. Saying that she now sees through the darkness and the lies of the Shadow, Senua manages to clear her head. And Senua speaks with Fagrimer. Tell him. You are wrong, Fagrimer. The giants, they can be killed. There is a way. Well, I'm not sure I believe that. But I think if anyone can find a way, it's you. He 
he knows we are special. Before, when I rescued you, he understood. You said you. you were waiting for me. He felt us coming. But I'd never met you. How can he see inside well, you? I knew someone would come. Somebody different. You are different. Somebody with the ability to look at the world and see what might be. You are special. Now what is? She's not special. And that is you. She's just like the others. No, she I've is seen special. you listening to the voices that we cannot hear. To the Varadir and Gandir. Voices? How does he know about us? You have the ability to see behind the veil. You are a Seth Connor, a seer. Whether you know it yet or not. A seer? What is this he speaks of? Do you know, Senwa? Do you know this is you? Iltoiga. Where does she go when the sun is up? She brings suffering to everyone. A monster. She hides down there. Hiding. Waiting. Under the cover of the cliff. She's there most days. Just staying close. These people live in waiting fear. Waiting for us to slip. Constant fear. They are waiting but to you can die. cannot approach you down there in the shadows. You don't stand a chance. And she won't come out until it's night. You have to do something. This is why you have been called here, Senwa. They shouldn't live in fear. He knows. Listen to him. Have you heard of the Hidden Folk? Hidden Folk? The Hidden Folk? Yeah. Have you heard of them? A secret people. Powerful, aloof. Once they were gods or something like, but now they hide themselves in the earth. Even the giants steer clear. The giants fear them. If the giants fear them, they must hold the key to them. They hold the secret. Will they help us? Well, they have no love for men. Whatever ties we have are weaved from heartbreak and despair. Although I did consume their bitter bread. He has found them. Just once. So it is and not they impossible. Did what I sought. If he can find them, you can find <laughs> them. They will. They will test you. We have been tested They might before. even try to kill you. But if you win their favor... We might die. They might give you what you seek. Where can I find them? They will give us what we seek. There's a rock. Close to here. Where they are said to live. Its entrance is hidden. You might find it. She will find it. They want you to. You will. I will find it. We might die down there. No. We could die trying to find them. They will give us what we seek. They are dangerous. But they will help us. Before we continue, it's important to pick up on something that Fargrim has said. That he has seen her listening to the voices that he cannot hear. To the Verde and the Gander. Now the Verde are warden spirits and they are believed to follow the soul of every person from birth to death. According to Wikipedia, the word Gander can mean a variety of things in Old Norse, but refers mainly to supernatural beings. Then of course, he mentioned that Senua is a seer. Senua goes off in search of the Hidden Folk, but here's a little bit of lore. The Hidden Folk, or the Huldu Folk, are elves, although this is an area of contention. Supernatural beings that live within nature itself. They actually exist in a parallel world, and they apparently appear similar to humans but have some different characteristics. Some folk tales in Iceland caution people not to throw stones, as there's a possibility of hitting the Hidden Folk. In the lands of your birth, people live hidden too in the hills and stones. They may be the remnants of a godly race who lost a war with giants and, finding the world changed, retreated into silence. But you still see their carvings and circles from the time when they walked among men. Here, they know that if times are harsh, you may ask of the hidden folk to share their bounty and if you are strong and wise and good, they may hear your plea and send you aid. But if you are not, or if you do not respect the strictures they lay down, you might have your strife doubled. In this place, they know that sometimes the hidden folk will take their children and leave another in their place. These children may look the same as their own, but will be dazed and far away. 
or ill-tempered, and you know then you have a changeling in your house. Arriving at the rock that Fargrimma spoke of, Senua finds the signs that the hidden folk were there. She rearranges some strange stones that appear to shift the world around her. These shifts are her travelling to and from the parallel world of the Hidden Folk. Bizarrely, the Droiga seem to have infiltrated the world of the Hidden Folk. After fighting them off, Senua's manipulation of the world around her sees a nearby lake drain and she descends into some caves. Walking through these caves and playing with some Hidden Folk magic to reveal new pathways, Senua eventually comes to a body of water. And this is where things get creepy. Senua senses that something is in the water with her. The Furies are telling Senua that the Hidden Folk are maliciously toying with her. She sees ghostly echoes of people in the water. They avoid the light, so Senua, as long as she has a torch, is able to pass through them. Using this light for safety, she comes across an area and she is confronted by an apparition. It's the Hidden Folk. They ask her what she's looking for and tell her that she's not worthy of their help. But Senua pushes on through the caves and she sees something into the distance. A glowing figure. Senua grabs a torch and walks towards the figure. Her surroundings completely change. Is she outside or is she still in the caves? Using the Hidden Folk's magic and cooperating with the glowing figure, Senua walks through the now open area and she hears the Hidden Folk's tune has changed. They tell her that in using her eyes to see what might be, she has earned their aid. Dropping down to another part of the caves, Senua is attacked by something horrific. Some monsters. These are more Droiga, however they are different. More feral, like they are trying to bite and eat her. After fighting them off, Senua hears someone asking for help. Senua passes her sword to the person in need. Problem is that she's now without a weapon. Walking through the caves is now a very tense time, seeing as Senua is unarmed. She's being taunted by the monsters. Beginning to wonder where the hidden folk are taking her, Senua comes to a light. Moving through the cracks, she is safe. For now. Seeing the figure again, Senua manipulates the environment again and follows the figure. After a long crawl through a narrow passage, this leads her to an area with a small body of water. This area seems to be living and breathing. There's someone here. Watching. More than one. I know you. How? Where are they? Where are you? What do they want? I don't like it. I'm scared. This is too bad. woman. Their eyes everywhere can feel them boring into her. Witch. What is she supposed to do? Do something. Oh, Ask yeah. What do you want me to do? Him. Lost souls who fought through hell to find us. You are lost. Not anymore. The pool. The pool. Are you ready for what you will find here? What we will find? What if it's all for nothing? The Hidden Folk then leads Senua through a journey which tells her all about the giant, Ilatoiga. Senua learns that after the volcano erupted, it fills the sky with clouds of ash and blocked out the sun. Animals died and the crops withered. Humans became hungry as a famine hit. One woman had to leave her home to search for food, but found nothing. Humans turned on other in their desperation for food. The weakest died and the strongest survived. The woman had a baby with her her child. Not being able to find a suitable place to settle, she wanted to spare her child from the pain of the world, so she entered the caves thought to be home to the Hidden Folk. Her hope was that the Hidden Folk could take her child and raise it, as she was unable to do it for herself. She offers herself, her life, to Askia, the name of the volcano, in exchange for the power to triumph in this now different world. Askia accepted, and the woman would go on to be consumed by rage and despair. But Senua is in danger now, the Droiga are back, and they've been stalking her. Desperate, Senua screams into the portal that she needs her sword back. Her words and urgency sound strikingly similar to the words she heard when she gave her sword away earlier. This means that the person Senua heard asking for help earlier on was actually her future self. Anyway, another fight ensues and Senua has to kill all of the attacking Droiga. Eventually, Senua gets overwhelmed, but then they all disappear. How much of this was even real? 
gathering herself, Senua approaches the remains of the child that the woman left there, and the child was revealed to have died. The woman was Ilatoiga, and this was her child. On the garment wrapped around the remains of the child, a pendant reads, Ingen, the giant's real name. Senua has what she needs, the real name of the giant. Fargrim meets her and they carry the child's remains outside. Fargrim says that there's power in a name, and they prepare a ritual. The ritual opens up a gateway to Ingen's specific realm, a place filled with rage and fire. She is tormented and in lots of pain and anguish. She is chained up and is crying out for Senua to help her. Senua runs around the area, avoiding the deadly lava, and she breaks Ingen's four chains. She approaches the giant with the child's remains and hands them over to Ingen. All she wanted was her baby. She failed to protect her child, and it twisted her up inside, causing her to become Ilatoiga. In the light now, at least, Ingen turns to stone and is now in peace. You think you have triumphed, but this means nothing. This woman was no god, she was weak, like you. This changes nothing. I need to go home. Will your father join us if you tell him what you saw? Yes. He will not run from battle. He will lead us into it. There is more than the sword here. More than he can understand. No more slaves. And no more sacrifices. He is trying to swear. understand. Is no more he? sacrifices. No more cowering in our fortress. We could fight. We have. But not in the way he thinks. No more sacrifices, swear. I never wanted any of them. I just did not believe it was possible to defeat them. And now I see. A ray of hope. hope. If this is real, no more sacrifices. You have my word. This needs to be for something. Be sure of that. She is exhausted. We leave at sunrise. I will come with you. I know the cause. And he respected me once. I will bear witness to what was done here today. What are we going to do next, Sandor? What? Senua and her companions set out to reach the fortress of Borgar Virki. Senua still followed the path fate had laid for her, still sought to end the slaver's raids. But now she saw her destiny more clearly. End the suffering. End the sacrifices. By ending the giant's reign of terror. Fargrimer led them northwest, and after some time, they came out on the sea. Senua did not know the land, so trusted him to lead them. But Thorgester knew it better. This isn't the right way. I told you we need to head further inland. Oh, perhaps you're right. We need food and shelter. And there is a settlement nearby. Bothervik? Yes. Are you mad? They will kill me on sight. They hate the Bjork. <gasps> They've been pains in our houses since long before the fall. And do you think you might have given them a cause to hate you? Hmm? Don't worry, lad. I'll protect you. Walking through the hills and following the path towards Bardavik, Senua is still hearing the hidden folk talking to her. They tell her there can be peace. Senua's furies say that they've been called there. Senua is shown something else by the hidden folk who says that it's a reward. She can see the beauty of nature around her. This beauty changes soon after though, as back to reality a storm hits, and Senua finds that Thorgesta has been grabbed and they are confronted by the very people Thorgesta spoke of earlier, settlers from nearby Bardavik. This is not what you think. What? what is it? I know this is going to be hard to believe, but you have to listen. This woman here, Senua, she knows how to defeat the giants. We've, all of us, we've, we've seen she it. She has to trust us. Please make her trust us. 
She will believe you. Impossible. They can't be killed. We thought so too, but we saw it. We saw it, Austin. We're on our way to Borka Virkinal to tell the Kodi, to make him understand that we, we can fight back. He's telling the truth. I did not ask you that. Shut your mouth, or I will slit your throat. She is special. I know you have no love for the Bjork, but you can't trust me. Will she? This is the turning point, Austinus. We can start over. Start to rebuild what we had. I should trust Wagner. If this is true. Yes. She believes you. She wants to believe him. She's trying to understand. If this is true, you, Senor, tell me now. Look at her. Say it is true. She's exhausted. You can speak. She wants to believe you. Speak to her. She tell wants her. to trust you. Tell her the truth. It is true. She will believe us. She knows. She can see that we bring hope. We do. Okay. Prove it then. There's a giant. Here. Another giant. Another giant. He roams the beaches and sinks our boats, cutting us off from the sea. More death. And we're close to running out of food. More darkness. We can help these people. We can overcome it. Kill it. We need to get to Borgavi. Please. Remember, there are other people you must save. I cannot let more of my people die. Don't get distracted. We should kill it. We've taken down one. But there is a whole land of them. We need the practice. People will die if you help her. People and will I die if you don't. Fight. Please, Senor. People will die if you stay here. We are dying. People will die if you don't. You have to help her. Now it is time to lead, Senor. Now you have to choose. You can feel it. All right. Hold on to her. We will help her. Her people deserve hope too. Harald, she is like. Take you. them to the settlement and keep an eye on the Bjark. We want to help her. Senua, come with me. Whilst Fargrimmer and Thorgester are taken to the settlement, Senua and Astrida go to seek out the giant. Making their way across the jagged mountains and hills, Astrida explains that the giant is a giant of the sea and brings the storms with him. They end up being attacked by Mordroiga. Astrida runs off and says that the giant is heading for Bardavik, leaving Senua to fight them alone. After defeating them, Senua's furies ponder whether or not they can trust Astrida. Opening up more pathways using the Hidden Folk's magic, Senua manages to catch up with Astrida. The two split up again, and Astrida tells Senua that she'll meet her back at the settlement. Senua needs to learn more about the giant called Shavarissi. Once again, Senua has to use the Hidden Folk's magic in order to open up a pathway. This pathway leads her to another body of water, and she learns about the giant. She learns about a man from Bardavik. When the famine came after the volcano, the people of Bardavik helped each other through the starvation and the fear that came with it. The man was a key member of the community. Because of the volcano erupting, as Fargrim has said, it tore open the veil between the world of men and the world of the giants, and the giants came through it. Another community was also hungry, the Bjorg, Thorgesta's settlement, so they'd take from other settlements. They were ruthless. It wasn't enough for the Bjorg and they always wanted more, so they'd come back. They threatened the man, and terrified of them, the man made a deal. He'd hand over the settlement's leader to them, and as a result of the man's treachery, the leader was beheaded. The man thought he would be safe, but his people found out and cast him out. He would walk around the cliffs, homeless and hopeless, wracked with guilt. But then the sea took him. His blood would turn to brine, and the sea spat him out onto the shore as a giant. He would then go on to hunt those that he called his kin, bringing a constant storm to Bardavik. Senua didn't learn the real name of the giant, so she heads back to the settlement in the hope that Astrida will know. Getting there, Senua sees that the giant has indeed arrived at the settlement and is causing havoc. Senua goes to speak with Astrida. She reluctantly explains that the giant's name is Sega. The reason for her reluctance is that the leader that Sega sold out and betrayed was actually Astrida's father. With the name of the giant, Senua has what she needs. However, the Droiga attack the settlement, and everyone joins the fight, and fighting side by side, the group take all the attacking Droiga down. 
The shadow shows up again like a bad smell and tells Senua that she's damned them all. Senua begins to feel the weight of all the lost souls, that she had drawn the Droiga there herself. To honour their sacrifice, a plan is formed in order to deal with the giant. The giant resides around the cliffs. Senua plans to draw Shavarisi into the sun, and in order to do that, due to the constant storms, Fargrima will need to perform a ritual to honour the sun. So, the plan is set in motion. Approaching the cave in the cliffs, they see Shavarisi crawl inside and take a nap. He hasn't seen them, so they take him by surprise. They throw flaming spears at him and draw him outside. With the ritual performed, the clouds part and Senua is transported to Shavarisi's realm. She must brace herself against the violent waves and get to the eye of the storm. Battling against the elements, hearing the cries of Shavarisi that he's sorry for what he did, Senua reaches the giant. He holds out his hand and passes away. Helped up by Thorgaster, he comments that Senua gets weaker every time she does this. He says that they still need to deal with the giant of Borgavirki. They all leave Bardavik. In order to get to Borgavirki, they have to travel through a forest known as Janvida, a forest to the east of Midgard. It's said to be inhabited by a troll woman and giant wolves, and is also said to be home to an ancient witch or giantess, who herself had borne many giants as sons, these sons taking the forms of wolves. As they're walking through it, they see why people fear the place. It burrows into their minds and a rotten spirit moves through it. They see what they fear the most, and the place torments them with it. They think that they hear things and see things moving around them. After they initially get separated, they meet back up again. Thorgester has been crying, clearly having been tormented by the forest, about something that he may need to do. They all gladly leave the forest behind. After a long journey, they arrive and are at the grim, cold lands of Borgavirki. They can see captured people tied up and left as sacrifices for the giant that stalks this land. The plan is that Senua and Thorgester will go inside the settlement, and whilst they're inside, Fargrimmer and Astrida will cut down the captured people and save them. Inside the settlement, they approach the Godi. Thorgester tries to tell his father what happened, about the storm, and the slaves being killed, and the giants. He tries to tell him what he's seen, that the giants can be killed, but as expected, he's not listening to what he has to say. Instead saying that what Thorgester is telling him is dangerously close to Godgal, or blasphemy. He says that they cannot defy the giants, and only he knows how to keep the gods at bay. Accusing Senua of being a liar, he says that he's going to use Senua as the sacrifice. The giant will take her as tribute. A man runs in and says to the goddy that the sacrifices are gone and have escaped, and says that the giant is coming. They take Senua to the gate. The giant, the tyrant, speaks to Senua and says that he is coming. She fights the men taking her to the gate and one by one she kills them off. Afterwards, she speaks with Fargrima and Astrida, who tell her that the slaves are safe. Not knowing where Thorgester is, Senua will go and find him. Fargrima says that they need to kill the giant here and now, and that this will show the Godi proof that the giants can be killed. Astrida suggests killing the Godi instead. Senua follows Thorgester's voice. She fights more men that are being thrown at her by the Godi and kills them all. She is then grabbed by the Godi, who tells her that he is coming the tyrant, the king. He explains that he and the giant have an understanding, an unspoken connection. He gives the giant blood and the giant gives him power. Thorgestra tries to reason with his father, but the two face off. And then this happens. <laughs> Senua is then taken on a journey by the Hidden Folk. She learns about the origin of the giants. When the volcano erupted, as with everywhere else, hunger and thirst hit the people. Survival of the fittest instincts took over. People who used to be friends turned on one another, but one man stood firm, the Goody. People needed a leader, so they followed this man, but he became more and more hungry for power, and people feared him. However, as things started to get better, his grip on people started to loosen. They weren't as fearful anymore. His strength was waning. Desperate to keep a hold of his power and his hold over his people, the man created and brought the giants forth from the shaking earth, the roaring sea, and the blinding snow. He brought them to be. The people became fearful again, and his hold over them was tightened once more. The man became a giant, and this man was the goddy himself. Approaching the goddy, he has Thorgesta, and he's decided to sacrifice his own son. Thorgesta reaches out to Senua and says that killing the goddy will only mean that someone else will just take his place. He tells her to kill the giant. 
He says that people will need a leader who will show them a different way, and he tells her his father's real name. It's Alephir. In the giant's realm, Senua fights the goddy who is very powerful. She uses his real name, Alephir, and this weakens him, and she sees his power leave him in a flash of white light. They're sent back to the real world, to Borgaviki, and the goddy's men stand around them watching them fight. Senua is beating him, and the goddy's people are turning on him. He pleads for Senua to have mercy on him as she picks up a rock, but she hears the shadow who says that if she kills the goddy, she will essentially become him, her father. She hears the hidden folk too, and they ask her what she would do for the truth. She replies that she will choose how to end it. Senua remembers that darkness is inside of her, and she says that part of her wants to let go of the fear, to let go of her shadows and be free. Senua then appears with war paint on her face with a group of people behind her. This vision fades, and she ponders whether or not that that is her fate, whether or not she is able to even choose her way, or whether it's already set out for her. She hears Thorgesta's voice telling her that they are not their fathers, and that there is always a choice, and that she can decide her fate. But Senua sees the paths all open to her. Fate is a lie we tell ourselves about our choices. This tale ends here. But she, she carries on. The game then ends. So again, we ask the question of how much of this journey was real. Just as was in the first game, a lot of what went on is open to player interpretation. In the first game, we get the impression that what we were seeing through Senua's perspective was largely guided thanks to what Druth had taught her about Northman belief and folklore. She projected these teachings from Druth into her surroundings. And one line that kind of threw me off slightly was when Senua said this. I have killed a god, Fagrima. Is she referring to Hela? In Senua's mind, she may have indeed killed a god, but judging from the ending of Senua's sacrifice, Hela seemed only to be a representation of part of Senua's own psyche, but that's something that we've already discussed. The second game blurred the lines not only between what was real and what was conjured up by Senua's mind, but now, as we have characters that interact with Senua in the second game, we have a blurring of the lines between what is reality and what is fantasy. I'm talking about the giants here. It does seem that the other people with Senua can see these things as well. This is seen through both encounters with the giants. At one point, a volcanic eruption was mentioned and how a famine had hit the land. This caused people to turn on one another, the weakest died and the strongest survived, and certain humans turned to cannibalism. Now, I may be way off, but this could be what the Droiger are. Senua had conjured up the Droiger being undead monsters, and this was something that was echoed by both Thorgestra and Fargrima because they grew up around this folklore and likely really did believe in it. If we step away from the more fantastical side, the more logical explanation for the Droiger is that they are feral humans. Driven mad due to the lengths that they went to in order to survive the famine caused by the volcano, this would explain the Droiger in the caves too, that they went in there for shelter from the ash and dust from the volcano and had gotten stuck and lost down there. There's also the actual folklore which, as mentioned earlier, says that the Droiger are said to undertake rituals in order to try and obtain the goodwill of the gods. It's possible that they were not worshipping in a Toiga at all. Of course, this is all open to player interpretation. But whether or not this was all real, hinges around the actions of Alephir or the Godi. The giants we see in the game don't seem to have been part of the mythology either, as it seems that the humans that became these giants had become cursed through their own guilt, shame, despair or anger. The game says that the Godi had created the giants, but I'm not sure how exactly that was done. I guess the fear of these giants that he instilled in his people led to them obtaining sacrifices, hence why they went to Senua's lands and took the people as slaves. It could be that the fear of these things only made people believe that they were in fact real, that Alephir wanted control over all of the people in the land, so he caused people to be cursed, meaning that the giants weren't giants in the traditional sense, they were in fact some form of magic. No, I will shine a light on your lies and they will see the truth. There are no giants, it's just you, Alephir. Instead of the slaves being sacrifices to the giants, they were in fact sacrifices to the gods, so that Alephir could retain his power and his strength. One final thing is that Senua appeared to be able to see the echoes of the dead. This coincides with what Fargrim has said about her being a seer, and being able to hear the dead. She sees these things when loads of her people died at the start of the game. She also sees it in the caves of the hidden folk, 
It's possible that she gained this ability during her time in the Land of the Dead, Helheim, but I'm not certain this was the case, it's just a theory. It's perfectly okay as well to think that everything in the first game was indeed in Senua's own mind, and that everything that happened in the second game was actually real. These games and the stories within them are purposely ambiguous. It seems that maybe Ninja Theory had the first game focusing on Senua helping and accepting herself, and then the second game, now that she's accepted her condition, was Senua helping her people this time round. It was more about her finding and following her destiny. But that is pretty much it for this video explaining the entire story of Hellblade. Maybe we'll get a conclusion to Senua's story in a third instalment. If you enjoyed this video then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel, leave your thoughts, theories and comments down below, but for now take care and I will see you in the next one. Thank mm -hmm. you.